asking you if we could please uh, just stand for a minute's silence for the tragic events in, in Nice. Um, I'm sure we would like to know what everybody has lost the fault in that terrible incident. So could you stand for a minute, please? Thank you. Members' Code of Conduct, Declarations of Interest. Are there any members who wish to declare any interest, Stuart?
extra money, there's some 3.2 million we've invested in our road network, and a similar amount, just over 3 million, in the installation of LED lighting, um, which I think is, is, a, is a great program because it has long term, significant long term savings as well as uh, helping us with uh, uh, you know, our carbon footprint. So um, I think we've, we've, those are some really good investments that we could be made um, in, in the last year. Uh, the rest of the report is, um, I think, self-explanatory um, in terms of uh, the collection summary. So I'm, I'm really going to ask members to turn to page two, recommendations in page two, um, and ask you, can we agree those recommendations? Really? Anna, did you want to say something? I did, Chair. Yeah. I mean, Uh, 
uh, savings during 15 to 16. Uh, I think that's, um, that's a really good outcome. Um, they, they've done that, uh, not least, spells out in detail in three, paragraph 315, uh, by reducing the amount of external borrowing that we've had to, to do during the year. As we all know, the uh, advantage of reducing your external borrowing is that you don't have revenue uh, payback uh, commitments. Um, so, so I think I'd like to sort of um, record my thanks to the Treasury Management Team for, uh, for that outcome. And obviously that um, four million um, is, is money that we can add back into the, uh, the general fund balances to support the overall budget. So uh, I think that's a really good, good outcome from the, um, from the work of the Treasury Management Team. So i uh, just ask you to look at recommendations on page 46, unless we have any other any other questions, comments? No? So, page 46, um, we agreed the Treasury Management Annual Report, 1516, we agreed, and the transfer of those savings, 4, uh, 4 million from capital finance activities to the general fund balance being noted. Can we agree those things? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right, um, on to item. Six, which is uh, the revenue monitoring report for the first quarter of 1617. Uh, um, so this, again, I'll just kind of introduce this by saying that we um, are looking at, at the moment, a, a small overspending of 1.1 million, um, against, which is, as it says in the introduction, less than 0.5% of our revised Revenue budget. Um, clearly, you know we are we are continuing to have a very challenging situation. I'm sure Chris and Tony will attest to that in our children services and adult services about growth of demand. Um, that's that's proving to be very uh, challenging in terms of keeping on top of that. But I know both cabinet members and officers are working flat out to um, to, to reduce that. I mean, um, again, partly through the kind of prudential financial management of having a, um, a revenue contingency element in our budget, we're able to deal with, with that uh, situation. Um, but not, you know, notwithstanding that, we do need to keep on top uh, of the, uh, the pressures, particularly on those, on those two um, departments of the council. Um, obviously pleased that we've, we've got the old George of New Homes bonus that we're, we're, we're able to uh, build back into the, the balances, and, and obviously we've had um, an additional amount of money we've had to find for uh, paying our uh, staff in private care as a living wage, which is important. Uh, we've had to find part of that from our reserves, um, which, which again uh, is reflected in this report. So, um, unless there are any, are there any other points, I'm just going to go to the recommendations here. Anybody want to? So just to ask you to look at the recommendations on page 64, um, can we agree those recommendations? Okay. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay. That takes us on then to item seven, which is the capital monitoring report again for quarter one um, to June 16, and uh, the, the, the headlines for, for that report is that we have a. Um, Capital spend thus far 2.7 million with the quarter of the financial year uh, elapsed. Um, and we've got a revised capital program that's set out in Table 1, page 75, 58, or 9, 7 million. It's important, some important schemes which are listed in the, um, the appendix 1 in that, um, in that program. So, again, I think this is primarily for, for noting. So, unless there are any detailed questions, I'm going to ask you to. Look at the recommendations on page 73. Can we agree those recommendations? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, that takes us on to item 8, which is the uh, um, Rural 2020 plan, one of the key and strategy is around digital. And um, Matthew, can you introduce this, please? Thank you. Happily, thank you very much, Ned. Um, I hope I'm ready with this. Uh, this is the first that our borough. Um, I think 
think some context is useful for understanding why we're producing this. Um, I think people now access services and, and get online groceries and download their music when they want, how they want, where they want. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and when we were doing search for this, we, we found that in 10 years' time, 90% of them will be carrying either a smartphone, that's what we did, um, or a tablet. And I think with the 4G technology and um, expanding both in terms of its speed and in terms of its accessibility, I think people will be expecting a change in, uh, in how services are accessed and, and delivered on rural. Um, so, <coughs> okay, I think a good quality digital strategy can help residents and business access those services and the high speed broadband. Um, I think it's also important to note that it can save significant amounts of money um, and those and it's reported uh, in, in the third one. Actually, if all councils across the country made good use, perhaps just full use of their digital technologies, they could save some £14.7 billion pounds every year. So clearly, as, as Anne pointed out, the Tory austerity projects that seem to be slowing down anytime soon, it's going to be important that we deliver those savings as, as, in every way possible we can. So we have a strategy here that sets out a vision that by 2010, 2020, Every resident will have the ability and, and the skills to connect to people, services and the world online. Every business, every business will be connected to global markets through high-speed and reliable broadband. And every service will be available online in a simple, accessible and seamless format. I think this is a, a vision that sets out how we can achieve that. So I am I'm pleased to commend this to the cabinet for the recommendation as set out on page 88 um, to approve this strategy. And can I just as well thank uh, the officers that have produced this to get, um, report, the partners from the Royal Partnership that have, have helped put this together, um, and actually Councillor Stewart with him as well for his support on, on this over the last few weeks in, in making those additions. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Matthew. Um, <coughs> Councillor Stewart, do you want to add to that?
technologies and evidence and will involve the contribution of a wide range of partner organisations. At its core is the commitment that everyone in the world will live in a good home, recognising that this is an essential prerequisite to their good health, well-being, social mobility and general quality of life. The strategy details how the authority will work with others over the next five years and focuses on three key themes. One, building more homes to meet our economic growth ambitions. 3,500 new homes to be built. This will help boost the local economy by creating jobs and training opportunities and help the authority increase council tax income. Two, Improving the quality of Willis housing offer for our residents includes making the best use of existing stock and ensuring quality is improved. For example, addressing empty properties and the extension of selective licensing to private landlords, which in time will see neighbourhoods improved and the local environment outlook enhanced. Three, meeting the housing and support needs of our most vulnerable people to enable them to live independently, including provision of 300 new extra care units across 8 to 10 homes and, and 2,000 home adaptations. To this end, we will also give support and advice to help address and prevent homelessness. I would ask members to consider the strategy in full as set out in the appendix. This <coughs> is a challenging strategy for us all, but one that is key to us realising our greater ambitions for the world. I can assure members that this strategy is underpinned by a previous extensive consultation with a range of stakeholders, which is continually refreshed and its delivery action plan as set out will also be regularly monitored, reviewed and updated over the course of the next five years. I therefore ask Cabinet to approve the strategy as set out in Appendix 1 to this report. Thanks, okay, thanks George. Um, again, I, I certainly welcome this, this strategy. I mean, it has got some ambitious targets, but I think achievable. Um, I just want to reiterate, you know, 3,500 new homes by 2020 um, to meet demand as well as generate valuable additional council tax uh, receipts. And also, I think a particular issue that you highlighted, George, is bringing empty homes back into right. to use. Um, I think that's, uh, that's important. And also, I think, I think it's, it's really important that we, we do extend the selective licensing scheme, which is a tried and tested way of improving particularly the private sector housing in, in the borough. We've got four areas at the moment um, that are, are subject to the selective licensing uh, system, and I'd like to see more areas put, put under that scheme um, over the next, um, the next five years. Uh, so I think this is, a, 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 as I say, an ambitious but achievable um, uh, set of targets, and I think uh, will uh, create significant numbers of jobs as well as giving people decent houses to live in. So, um, and, you know, I think we all say, um, I'd really like to see some high quality apprenticeships come out of the new house building program. I think that's important as well. Yes, Anne? Chair, can I just, um, you know, add to what you said about the selective licensing scheme? I think it's been a huge success story. It's not only raised the quality of housing for uh, local residents, but it, it's also landlords have seen, you know, the values of their properties increasing because of the renovation works that have been done in those areas. And it really has been a great boost. I hope we can extend the third that scheme and see a lot more of it from the private rental sector because it really has been uh, you know, huge success. Okay, any other, any other points? No? Okay, so um, I ask you to uh, look at the recommendation page 116 that we approved the, the housing strategy 2016 to 2020. Mm -hmm. Is that good? good? Okay, thank you very much. Which takes us then on to item 10, which is the core strategy local plan, strategic housing market assessment update. Um, again, members will have the, the, the detailed report in front of them, but clearly uh, as part of the, uh, the core strategy local plan process, we need to include detailed assessments of the housing market in the borough, and this uh, uh, document we've got in front of you, the strategic housing market.
assessment and the uh, strategic housing plan availability assessment is, is a um, absolutely kind of key element of that. Um, we, we've clearly got some um, challenges in terms of the, the housing targets that we need to, to hit over the next um, 15 to 20 years. There are various scenarios which, which the, um, the strategy go, goes through. I think quite rightly we're going to put this out to publicate to uh, publish this and go out to consultation to see what the public think of the various sort of scenarios that are set out. I'm going to have a, a further report back to Cabinet in September um, when we've, uh, we've, we've gone through that process. So really I think for today it's just um, asking Cabinet to um, approve these, uh, these two uh, key assessments and studies uh, that we've recently published them on our website uh, and in public libraries um, for consulting with the public and we have, we've got a, a, a further, further report back in the autumn um, at the end of that process. So these are the recommendations I'm going to be on page 146. Unless there are any detailed questions, I just ask you to agree those recommendations. to item 12, which is the Wirral Global Risk Management Strategy. Now, I'm going to ask um, Mark Kilmore, who uh, Mark is going to come along today, just to uh, take us through this important new strategy. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, Councillor Rooney, the Port of Mobile, on behalf of the Lenders Report, in a absence of one meeting today. Um, so, this report uh, is asking Cabinet to approve the Wirral Global Flood Risk Management Strategy. This is a document that is a DEFRA requirement and all local authorities or the local flood authorities have been putting these in place over the last 12 months or so across, across England. Uh, the report sets out the context for the requirements under the new Flood and Water Management Act. Um, the strategy identifies the various types of flooding and coastal erosion. It is a high level strategy document and there is also a detailed plan that will be required to be built or improved. Um, in terms of uh, linking into the Will 2020 pledges, well, first of all, we had the, um, uh, uh, the flooding in September and August last year. We're going to be doing a separate Section 19 flood investigation report, which is due to report to um, uh, Environment Urban Scrutiny Committee tonight. But 
this strategy builds on top of that and lays out the groundwork. It links into two specific pledges, which are Whittle's neighbourhoods are safe and Whittle residents live healthier lives, given the properties that are affected by flooding, it has dramatic and drastic effects on the health of those uh, um, uh, residents who live in those properties, one through the length of time to obviously uh, move back in after any repairs that are required, uh, and also about that um, future mental health uh, uh, health issues related to every time it rains, they feel they may flood again if, if things aren't in place. The plan itself, uh, well, the strategy itself is accompanied by an action plan and, and a detailed strategy document. Um, the action plan uh, picks up on the five key objectives which are laid out in the DEPRA template. The first one is that the strategy itself must understand the local risks of flooding and coastal erosion. Um, we've been doing quite a bit of work over the last few years trying to map out what those risks are in terms of the complexity around uh, hydrology across the borough. Objective two says to ensure that the guiding principles for sustainable development are applied and inappropriate development is avoided. And one of the things that the new act requires is that flooding uh, 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 consultation is now a statutory requirement of the planning applications. Objective three says where financially viable, uh, the council or the local flood authority should build, maintain, and improve local flood and coastal erosion management and infrastructure. Objective 4 says about increasing public awareness of the effects of climate change and the, and the implications for an increase in flood risk from climate change. And then Objective 5 talks about support and assist those bodies responsible for improving detection, forecasting, and issues of warning. The strategy itself has had a comprehensive consultation which was carried out uh, uh, with the public and key stakeholders in February and March 2015. We've also undertook strategy consultation with Natural England, and these strategies were supposed to be in place by March 2016. But because of some of the uh, 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 because some of that strategy consultation with Natural England, there was a slight delay to this, and hence that's why we're reporting now with the strategy. Um, in terms of the ongoing uh, uh, the ongoing oversight of this, we think this will be picked up in the management. Uh, risk arrangement, which again is also going to open the scrutiny committee tonight for them to uh, peruse and, and, and hopefully agree, um, so that any work in the action plan will be monitored through both the Whittle Flood and Water Risk Management Partnership and overseen by the environment to open the scrutiny committee. Um, happy to answer any questions, Jen. Yeah. Okay, Anne? In terms of the river flooding, the environment 
starting to put an extra river monitor in into the Birkin now. So hopefully again in that area, it's not specifically, that wouldn't happen again. We get early alerts. That information is also available online for residents to watch and monitor themselves rising uh, river levels. And obviously the systems that are in place to prevent flooding uh, as much as possible are in place to activate upon those trigger points. So again, as we move through the action plan for section 19, flood investigating to that specific incident, a number of those uh, uh, recommendations will be worked upon to improve both all statutory partners' response to flooding, but also to work with our communities about building their understanding of flooding and how they may increase their propensity to prepare for that flooding and protect their own properties if that's, if that's at all possible. And that's a big drive for us through, that, through those recommendations.
a hundred, or just under a hundred domestic properties suffered internal flooding. Five thousand, but that's half a million pounds worth of, of funding that should have been made available. We're pursuing that because the government has said that other authorities that were affected and are able to draw that haven't been as efficient in drawing down that money. So we're still pursuing that and seeing if we can get them to overturn that deal. Okay. Well, obviously, anything I can help on that score, I'll just let me know. Okay. Any other questions on this report? Okay. If not, can I thank Mark for uh, taking us through it? And uh, if I can ask you to. Uh, just turn to recommendation on page 188, which is to approve the, the uh, rural local flood risk management strategy and the accompanying action plan for the future management of flood and coastal erosion risk on rural. So is that agreed? Agreed. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. Okay, um, and that takes us then to item 13, which is the transport plan for growth program 2016-17. Stuart. Okay, thanks, Bob. I'm delighted to be presented to the report to the government. The recommended sections are 1.375 million pounds of participated transport reform of the local city region and private authority. The recommendations as to whether all should be invested to support the regular pledges in the world plan. We're all as a wonderful place to be right ambitious for both rural and our citizens. In order for rural and our citizens to thrive in the growth economy and provide paying jobs, it is vital that they have a transport network that is safe, efficient, and attracts employees to our wonderful part of the world. Equally vital is the crucial report to a safe and efficient transport network and ensure that our peaceful coasts like countryside and other village activities are as far as accessible as possible. Not to mention its importance in ensuring that our education system is accessible to each people and ensuring that we are able to deliver the best of Proposed improvements to our highway infrastructure are set out in the appendix, support the priorities are set out in the connecting rural transport strategy. Additionally, I'm delighted that we are in a position to continue to support local decision making by recommending investments of £130,000 in the fourth district's communities. I believe that this investment will help 